So first of all, I just wanted to say that I'm really happy to be here and I want to thank organizers for setting up this amazing conference. And I'm pretty sure you already uh, enjoyed uh, the previous day that we had a training and the amazing keynote today and yesterday and just wish you to enjoy all the next two days packed up this conferences. And also I'm really honored that John invited me to speak at this conference. So today I'm going to talk about Scala and Kubernetes and how we can actually connect these two worlds or ecosystems. So I'm Axelana and I work at Captify, the bigger developer. Uh, Captify is a UK company and it's the independent uh, largest holder of user search data outside of Google. Also, since recently, I'm diversity and inclusion ambassador for Kiev office at Captify, and I've been a part of Women Who Code community as a lead and mentor for the last four years. And also, I'm a speaker and I used to travel a lot, but mostly before quarantine. So today, I'm going to talk about Kubernetes in general, like the theory behind the scenes, how things work with Kubernetes, and then I'm going to move to Scala and Kubernetes, a bit of theory as well, and practical examples uh, hopefully will be interesting for you in the format of the demo, but I'm still gonna have to bit, give kind of a bit of theory about the objects I'm going to create there. So uh, Kubernetes came into the spotlight as a technology in the recent five years, I would say, like it came in this huge adoption. And uh, since then, more and more companies are using this technology. For example, it's been introduced into Spark as well. So the first question would be like, why Scala engineers should be interested in Kubernetes? Well, mostly because uh, we as developers have to deploy our applications, whether in test environment or production environment. So it's very useful to know how to work with Kubernetes for that. And we can not only deploy our Scala applications, but also we can deploy like helper applications for gathering metrics and getting alerts and so on. So Kubernetes is not just a framework, it's more like an ecosystem because there is an API with the objects, there are client libraries which allow to reach to those objects. So we have like a lot of components that work together in order to build Kubernetes the way it is right now. So uh, in terms of um, Kubernetes objects, uh, we have these, the most basic ones, which include uh, deployment, replica set and pod. Pod is the most basic one. Basically we just deploy a Docker image or any other image for our application. Replica set is a bit higher up the hierarchy as it allows to have multiple pods or multiple replicas. And deployment contains the like replica set, and which means multiple pods of the replica set. So it's like wrapping one another and it has additional features like rolling upgrades, for example. Uh, there are also stateful set and daemon set, which are used for different cases. They are very similar in terms of setup to the deployment. So stateful set is used to deploy stateful applications like databases, for example, Postgres SQL. And they, it has uh, other interesting features. For example, um, in Kubernetes, we usually have uh, auto-generated names, which is not very convenient, not always at least. And stateful set allows to have ordering of these pods. So we can just reach out to the pod by the name of the stateful set and its number, which is really cool. And there also there is a daemon set, which is uh, used for utility purposes. And uh, daemon set here just helps to like, gather the metrics, for example, from each node of the cluster. So it's more like a utility service. And also there is a volume which helps to deploy the data to store it and embed it into Kubernetes objects and the service for just connecting various objects in the outside world. So those are not all of the objects that rely in Kubernetes API, obviously. Also we have uh, a classification of types for each of those objects. And therefore, I think uh, the learning curve for Kubernetes is a bit high because you kind of need to understand when to use each of those. 
But we are going to start only from the first basic ones in order to grasp how, it's, how it is to work with Kubernetes from Scala. So uh, first of all, I wanted to show the process of creating the object in Kubernetes. So we would understand how it happens behind the scenes before we get to the Scala code. And we have these four main uh, controlling components, which is kubectl, the command line tool. Uh, so each com command from kubectl sends a request for the API server. API server here uh, helps to track and validate all the requests. And requests come in the form of YAML file, for example. And in the YAML file, we would define the Kubernetes object that we want to create. So API server validates those objects in the help, with the help of etcd, which is a key value store, and it stores information about various objects. And there is a controller manager, which constantly runs on the background and checks if our desired state of the system uh, is the same as the actual one. The actual one is the exact number and types of objects that we have in the system, while desired one is the one that we created in our YAML file. For example, two pods or like one replica set, that's our desired state. And there is a scheduler. So controller manager usually brings the scheduler to actually create objects if we don't, don't have those. So deployment of pods, their creation would look like this. You would have from left to right uh, a kubectl command is created in the YAML file, for example. And this, this command will be sent to the API server. The API server will validate this etcd that actually that's a valid request, that's a valid type of object, a valid version of object, number of objects, and so on. Then controller manager checks that our desired state is to have two parts, while in reality we have zero for now. So it will kind of ask the scheduler to actually schedule those pods. And on the second part of the slide, we can see two new components, which is kubelab and kubeproxy. So kubelab helps to connect the actual node of the cluster to the, this kind of controller management panel, I would call that, with all this scheduler and controller manager. So kubelet here is this link between the pods, between the nodes to the API server and other components. Kubelet helps to actually schedule those pods and then it tracks constantly uh, the health of, the, of those pods, whether they are running or not, and sends updates so that the life cycle could continue. In case some of the pods fail, the controller manager would have to ask scheduler to reschedule them. And there is a queue proxy, which is like a network communicator that allows the pods to communicate with the world and with one another. So I would say that all the objects are created in the same manner in Kubernetes, not only the pods. So uh, this uh, concept is, uh, is helping to grasp in general how objects are created in Kubernetes and when we are going to create them with the code uh, that's exactly what's going to happen behind the scenes. So getting to the question of Scala and Kubernetes. As I said, Kubernetes has an API of objects and therefore we can connect to the API with Scala, basically a Scala client. But in reality, we don't have like the native Scala client, but we have a Java client or JVM based client uh, actually two of them even that can be used for those purposes. So the one on the left, Java Kubernetes client is the official one. And uh, uh, it's like promoted in all the documentation, but uh, I didn't have really good experience with that one because it has limited functionality. Uh, it's not enough of functions you can use, not enough of fun stuff. Usually you would just create an object and that's it, maybe delete it, but uh, it, it just doesn't give enough flexibility that it's useful for tests or production environment, especially. And there is also a Fabric.io, which is community-driven effort to create this client. It's again a Java-based, so the source code and examples are in Java. But I just 
kind of compile them to Scala and you can use them from Scala as well. So uh, I would recommend this one much more. It has some more clear functionality. Uh, it has like wider functionality and I'm going to use this client in my examples. So getting to the practical examples, I'm going to show a bit of code which I pre-typed and you will see, you will see why I actually pre-typed it because uh, it's quite a, an API that um, just needs a lot of code to set up all the objects. And I will use this, um, the concept of testing or more like integration testing. So why exactly testing? Um, basically in integration testing, you usually need to set up the whole environment which will mimic the production level environment. And it's good in our case, because I'm going to create various objects, kind of mimic that we set up the environment. Then we can run some mock tests. And after that, we can purge everything. So the workflow will be like that for all the test specs that I created. The creation of the environment, uh, some tests, and the deletion of all the objects. In such a way, we have kind of a closed life cycle. So I'm going to create a pod and replica set that we already seen. Uh, all the other objects, I'm just not going to create them. There's not enough time to show all of them, but uh, many, of the, many of those actually have similar setup. So basically, we are going to see the approach to creation, which is easier to map to all the other objects plus the right examples for those in Fabricate.io library in GitHub. And one more object that I wanted to show is called a custom object because it's a bit more interesting to work with such objects as Kubernetes has an API. It's possible to extend this API and the extension will be the custom object itself. So why we actually need this extension? Uh, because there are some applications that it's easier to uh, create specified properties for those applications. For example, Spark application, we want to have some driver executor resources as properties. So it's very comfy for that to use a custom object. And there are two main approaches to create these custom objects. I'm not going to dive deep into it. I'm just going to explain like in general way. So on the, left, on the left, the one, like the most common approach, it's a setup of deployment of stateful set in the YAML file, as usual as we do when working with Kubernetes and setting up uh, the automation workflow because then we have to manage the state somehow. And in this example, we see that it's a database. And another approach is called the operator because we just set up the operator definition in YAML file, apply it, and the operator will create all the necessary objects for us, whether it's a stateful set, services, volumes, or configurations, and the state is managed by ETCD, which is fairly comfortable to use as well. So now I'm going to show the code. I think for that, I will reshare the screen. Yeah, hopefully you see my code already. So, so here I have uh, a spec with pod test and I have the definition of the pod. And you can see that it's quite a lot of um, configurations here. We have a metadata part, which mimics the YAML file because we have the name, we have the label, same as in YAML file. And there is a spec part with the container image name, name itself of the container, and we have a port because we are going to use Nginx in that. And uh, before actually the create call on this pod, nothing happens. It's just the definition of the pod. So you can see already that it's quite tedious and I will show a bit later another way to do that without all these message calls. So here we can call client client pods and then create the pod. And exactly at that moment, the pod is getting created. So here I just put a simple sleep, but we can also create a watch on the pod state. Uh, watch is, is going to wait until the pod is getting up and only after that some functionality can run. And here I also checked that we actually have uh, the pods being created in this namespace. So I set up the namespace and as I pre-run the test, you can see that we have one pod being created. Therefore, we like waited in order to get the 
pods to be created. And then we kind of have some tasks, which is not really important in, the, in this case. And after that, I can run delete. So I'm going to run this delete method, which is similar to create. It's going to be a request, as we've seen before, to the API server to delete the pod. And we're going to wait for some time and check if the pod was actually deleted. And that's true, we have zero pods. So that's it for the pod. Very simple setup. We just need to create everything, call this method of create, and check if it was created at all. And I would say that usually we wouldn't use like, the pod as a single object. Usually we would want to wrap it up in deployment or replica set. And that's exactly what I did in, in another test spec, just to see how it looks like. Oh, yeah, also didn't mention that uh, there is a default Kubernetes client, which is used for all of that. You just can uh, extend it like in default way or set up some parameters like the link to the Kubernetes client if it's production environment. And the replica set has even longer definition, like it doesn't even fit into the screen. And uh, I would say that one more like um, disadvantage of that definition is that you actually have to kind of remember the order because it's not random. You see here that you need to open some metadata part and close it. And same here, you just open spec part and close it here. So that's why I say that it's quite tedious because you need to remember all those. You need to remember where to set up the labels. Usually it will be like more like a copy pasting from uh, the examples because you wouldn't actually remember all that order just at once by using it only once. I mean, so here we have very similar to the pod setup, the name of the image, the image itself, and we set up a bit of labels on and we'll show how to use labels too. So we are creating replica set, again, the same call to the client, very similar. Uh, and I'm going to wait for some time, but this time I'm not, I'm not just going to check of the namespace for all the pods. I'm just going to use the label for that, which I set up. So I'm going to check if we actually have this, uh, this pods with this label in the namespace, which corresponds to the replica set. And we will get the number of those pods. And as a result, we will just drop the replica set without checking because replica set will purge everything after just dropping it. And here we have only one line of the log, which is uh, the pods that were created. We had two replicas, therefore we have two labeled pods. So uh, as a conclusion of this example, uh, we can create a bit more complex object. Uh, deployment will be very similar. And we will set up the replica set, which in its turn will trigger the pods creation because uh, the pods are kind of embedded into replica set or on the contrary, replica set wraps up the pods. And you can see here that we set up the Nginx. So we can imagine like we would use a server for our tests or we can set up uh, a stateful set for the database and use uh, a database for our integration tests, uh, which is also fairly useful. And the environment will just purge itself after the end of the test. And uh, the next example is custom resource definition. It's a bit more complex. It's the custom objects I was talking about. And this time I'm going to deploy a Postgres SQL. So you can see here that the definition is a bit shorter, but basically because I'm using a helper method. So uh, we have here new properties. It's the API version because we have the API extension and it's going to be version beta one can be anything different for another custom resource. And we have the instance name, which I defined a bit hard, it's a test, the namespace, uh, the Postgres SQL, and there are specific features like the group of the CRD, which refers to the operator that I'm using, uh, the instance name, um, the plural, the version, and so on, and so on. And uh, one more thing is this 
open API schema like. So I didn't want to type it and I reused uh, the method to just create the JSON file here. JSON file looks like this. It's a setup for the schema itself or the CRD. And basically uh, that's it for the definition of CRD. But as I said, it's not the best way actually to constantly use uh, this setup with calling multiple methods. We can do better. And uh, as people who work with Kubernetes a lot have to work with YAML files. And the second approach would be to actually use a YAML file, which I just read as a stream and provide to the custom research definitions. So the YAML file looks like this. Just don't pay attention yet to these uh, options. I will get back to it. So you can see here the whole custom resource definition setup, the version, everything. And it's pretty big because it's like similar to production level. So you can imagine how long we will have to set up all the properties if we want to actually be closer to the production level setup. In our case, it would be much easier to just provide the YAML file. After that, we can call create a replace, which is similar to all the other objects creation. And CRDs allow us to actually list uh, the CRDs in the namespace, except for the pods. And we are going to do just that. And also we are still going to wait a bit and release the pods just to check that we actually have those. And um, before I get to the last point, I want to show the third way to create it. So the third way is a bit, um, I would say a combination of the two because we are going to read the YAML file, but we're going to read it for a bit different purposes. As you maybe noticed that there are this weird to be changed for the parameters, which obviously should be different, so it should be some kind of Postgres SQL. But I did it just intentionally to pay attention to this case when we want to have multiple instances of specific application in our namespace. And by multiple instances, I mean that we can have multiple PostgreSQL instances for multiple tests, or with Spark, it's even easier to imagine. We have multiple completely different Spark applications in the same namespace for different tasks. And we don't want to set up the YAML file for each of those by just like copy pasting everything when basically we have only a few parameters that change. In our case, it's name, it's plural and singular. It can be some other custom property in the resources number. So in this case, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to call this load method, load YAML stream method, which I'm going to show. And um, basically it's going to be a string of YAML format. But before I get the string, I need to do a set of steps. So here we have like very hacky approach because actually for now Fabric AIO doesn't have an extension of um, actually editing YAML files on the fly, this Java or Scala code, which is uh, pretty, but for now they don't have it. And one of the suggestions of this hacky way is to use a map. Why exactly a map? Because we can represent uh, the YAML file as a map. Here is the key, metadata, and here is the value name and to be changed. And then uh, we can see that there is actually a nested maps because uh, as this is the key and this is the value, this is the key as well. And to be changed is the value for this key. So here we need to go like one and two levels deeper. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, it's still like not the best way to do that, unfortunately, but I'm just showing how I can change the value for the names to, for the plural and singular by passing the specific value I want and we can just parameterize this method. And uh, then I can also do the same for the SPAC and metadata part by sending them this updated uh, key value, which is a value for them. So basically I, I updated to PostgreSQL and I sent to this key that the value was updated. That's exactly what I'm doing here. And after that, I just uh, reformatted it to the YAML file again. And it, it just becomes this uh, YAML stream. And now the Kubernetes API is quite smart to read a string which has a YAML file. And actually it's pretty similar to that case. 
because here we read a stream. Here is just a stream. And uh, this time again, just nothing new happens here. Again, the creation of custom resource definition and everything that I shown before. Now to this interesting part. Uh, one more thing that we can do with this uh, client is to read the logs in nearly real time. So when I launch this uh, application, that's what I saw. So we have created CRDs, we have created CRD pods, we had only one. And then I asked to pass the logs and it's PostgreSQL, so we don't have mm, really interesting logs here because I don't have like, an instance setup. But you can see that there are like a lot of logs. And I would say that for uh, the case of um, any other application, like Spark application, it would be a bit more interesting because we would be able to see the actual progress of the application, which is useful in our tests for debugging and all the other purposes. And after that, I can just purge everything. And uh, again, the pods are getting deleted and we are going to check if they were actually deleted. So I'm going to switch to my presentation now. So uh, in this demo, I've just uh, shown uh, the ways to use this Fabric Data.io library, how we can create simple objects and more complex objects. And I hope that it was useful. And actually, I think that Scala and Kubernetes don't stand that far away, especially with adoption of Kubernetes with Spark. It's becoming like this it's an important tool for the job of the data engineer, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be and already is for some companies an important tool for Scala engineers. So uh, thank you for attention, and you can ask me questions uh, later in spatial chat, and I'm going to be uh, the whole day in Discord, and here's my contact info for the Twitter, GitHub, and the slides are already on the speaker deck, so you can check out there. And thank you for attention.